speaker is Maria Konovalenko from Moscow. She will be talking about the need for a database that will unify the biomarkers of aging uh, and other associated issues with that. All right. Um, hello, everyone. And um, well, first of all, I'd like to start with um, thanking Aubrey and thanking all the folks at Sense Foundation for inviting me here and um, also for putting up such a wonderful meeting. Um, please do carry on. We love Sense conferences. And um, of course, for the work that you're doing. Um, so, in order to prolong lives, um, you need courage, you need a good plan, and you need a lot of money. Well, we've got a good plan. Um, so the plan is to create an integrated uh, information system on biomarkers of aging. And right now I'm going to tell you um, about what, task, uh, what tasks the system is supposed to uh, accomplish, why we need this, also um, what it may consist of, and um, what's, what's the value of such a system may be. So, um, <clears throat> Right now, well, aging is an extremely complicated problem. And right now, um, the, uh, we have an, an enormous amount of data about aging. Um, we know quite a lot about its causes and the mechanisms of aging. But there is a very, um, well, serious problem um, that all of this data is uh, very disconnected. Um, and it prevents us from having a unified understanding of the mechanisms of aging and um, also um, the um, process of creation of new therapies um, to fight aging and age-related diseases is also slowed down because of that. So um, the information system will allow us to uh, systematize the fundamental, the basic knowledge about aging. Um, aside from scientific, uh, scientific papers about aging research, there's also a huge amount of clinical data about the um, um, age-related pathologies. Um, we all know that, um, for example, metformin extends life, right? But um, it, doesn't, it, it does so not in every mouse strain. And moreover, it uh, sometimes extends maximal lifespan and sometimes it, it, it just um, extends the median lifespan. Also, um, rapamycin um, was taken by um, quite a lot of patients who were recovering from uh, kidney transplantations. And it would be a very good idea to collect this type of data um, about the impact of rapamycin on the health of these patients because it may prove very, uh, to be very useful when we, um, <clears throat> um, when we will use rapamycin as a uh, geoprotector because we know it's a very, well, it's a potential geoprotector. Also, the system will allow us to uh, model uh, the um, processes of aging and um, we know that each person is unique. Um, each person has um, a unique genome, a unique epigenome, metabolic peculiarities, and um, the system will allow us to <clears throat> identify the best combination of uh, therapies that would cause maximal effect in this particular given person. So um, now let's take a look at um, what the um, <clears throat> database may consist of. So we see three steps um, in the process of creation uh, of such a um, um, well, complicated uh, software product. And this task is um, a non-trivial task. 
Um, so there are three steps. Uh, it's uh, architecture creation, the software development, and database population. And um, <clears throat> so here are the necessary steps that need to be taken um, while creating the database um, framework. The first of all, we need to identify where our information would come from. Obviously, scientific papers from PubMed, also electronic medical records, and already existing databases. I would like to draw your um, attention specifically to um, the importance of using um, electronic medical records. <coughs> if we um, collect the information um, about a particular person and compare it to the uh, scientific knowledge accumulated in the world by, by uh, the collective, um, then um, we would be able to come up with um, really um, fruitful results for, for a given patient. And here's um, a list of existing databases, and I just highlighted um, the most interesting ones like the um, HID, the GenAge, and the uh, NetAge databases. So in order, um, in order to um, <clears throat> um, get just, just the relevant information and incorporate and use it um, in our information system, we need some cr um, selection criteria because we don't really want you know, um, papers about aging of metals or something like that because it's not relevant uh, to biology. So um, here's just a list of terms that may be used for this preliminary um, <clears throat> at this preliminary phase of information extraction, but uh, maybe there are some other more specific terms which uh, need to be defined. Um, <clears throat> so the next um, really important stage is, um, all right, so we need to create the language, the, the dictionary that our system would, um, would use and um, <clears throat> a set of terms that it will operate with. <clears throat> a colleague of mine, um, Ekaterina Savitska, well, she um, just, just, this is an example. She mm, uh, used the mouse genome informatic da mm -hmm. database and she um, created a list of phenotypical terms um, she searched for aging and premature aging in mice. And here's just um, a little part of that list that she retrieved. And um, if you take a look right here at the top, um, you can see abnormal nuclear morphology and abnormal nuclear laminar morphology. Well, that's the same. That's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, our system needs to know that this is the same thing. So we have to. Um, identify the synonymous um, terms. Um, <clears throat> a, a really crucial um, moment. We need to identify the objects. So we decided to use qualitative and quantitative changes um, happening with aging um, and, use, and use this information as the objects. So um, these can be classified. This can be divided into five groups. The first one would be um, changes happening over time. And they can be, for example, molecular changes like increase in lipophosphine in lysosomes. These uh, type of changes can happen on physiological level. For example, um, a loss of um, undifferentiated stem cells in our peripher peripheral blood. Um, another subgroup of um, aging changes is um, changes that we see when we compare our experimental group to control. Also, on molecular level, like for example, we can see that um, when we add type 5 and T to diet, we um, there's a reduction in uh, the amount of amyloid uh, beta aggregates. And on the uh, physiological level, we can see um, reduction in cancer incidence in uh, rhesus monkeys. 
under caloric restriction, of course, um, <clears throat> and the f and um, mm, genetic changes. And um, here's an example of a genetic change that we would like um, our system um, to um, to have. So. Um, Obviously, changes need to be characterized, and here's um, a, lit of, a list of um, <coughs> characteristics. Our system has to know in what tissue the change is happening, in which organism, and uh, very importantly, um, in the system has to know what the temporal and spatial values of the change are. And here's an example. There were two groups of people analyzed. The one was 64 years old and um, the control group was 30 years old and there was um, <coughs> um, the authors of the paper looked at the um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells and they um, found out that there is the decrease in um, this um, microRNA expression. And so this is just an example of how the change description may look like. All right, of course, changes uh, are interrelated. And um, there are three types of uh, links, um, causal, associative, and ontological. And here's a beautiful chart that a colleague of mine, Alexei Maskalov, uh, created. He gave a talk yesterday about his um, work in Drosophilus in overexpressing um, stress resistance genes. So let's take a look here. We can see uh, just an example of a causal link in black arrows. We can see that increase in these microRNAs um, leads to um, decrease of um, SIRT1 activity. And telomere shorten is associated with um, increase of um, these proteins expression. And this chart, it actually links, um, well, um, events uh, in our cells and in our tissues here, things that are increasing and things around de that are decreasing in our body, and here are pathologies and markers of pathology. So, okay, um, changes can be ontologous. Um, we know that ONRF2 gene has different names and we know that um, the group of sirtuin genes, uh, and there's what, one, of, one of the genes is the, in this group is sirtu1. So um, <clears throat> the last step would be to um, identify how we're gonna retrieve the information. Well, obviously that's search, and we can, the user can um, look for particular keywords or phrases also he could choose everything that is in one um, category, like for example, molecular cancer markers, or he can choose a term um, from the um, alphabetic um, order list. And of course, modeling, that would be a separate unit. Um. <clears throat> All right, so we uh, looked at uh, the database creation. Now, um, just a couple of words about software development. Um, the first step would be to create the domain-specific language, which can be used uh, to describe. Um, that could be, well, mm, biologist-friendly, and can could be used to describe um, um, mm, events related to aging. And here's an example. There's Little B system. It was um, created in systems biology department in Harvard Medical School. And it's written in Common Lisp, uh, a computer programming uh, language, <clears throat> and it does these things. Here's an example. It's um, there's EGF and its receptor, and a complex is formed, and so the system can actually model the um, temporal um, relationship between the concentrations of these molecules. So. The main idea here is this is just an example of existing systems that can be used as a basis and modified in order to describe age, um, well, events related to aging. And database population, um, that's quite a daunting task um, since there's just enormous amount of data in the papers and in medical records. 
um, the extraction process has to be semi-automatic. So this means we just uh, will use um, um, tax semantic analysis tools, and there's a whole bunch of these. And <clears throat> well, inevitably afterwards, we'll need to go through all of that extracted data manually and verify it. Um, so these were the three steps in database creation, and now let me just very quickly um, um, walk you through what, why we need this. So we will identify the biomarkers of aging. Right now, about 100 of biomarkers are used in clinic, and, um, and there are claims in the literature that 150,000 uh, parameters can serve as potential biomarkers. We can model aging processes. Oh, this one is very important. Um, well, for example, well, just, just imagine, for example, we have a cure, um, cure from aging. Um, let's say it's a um, combination of melatonin, rapamycin, and a magical compound X, right? And we want to test it um, in humans, because that's, that's what we do. We mm -hmm. conduct clinical trials. But we, we cannot really aid for like 80 years um, until the trial is finished, because if the experiment is successful, that, that's actually bad news for us, because we'll be dead by that time, <clears throat> or <coughs> very old. And uh, we need to know what kind of changes in, in which exact parameters um, will definitely tell us that a person will live for another 80 years, and these parameters would be the biomarkers. Um, once we've, uh, I believe, identified the uh, panels of biomarkers, we'll uh, be able to conduct longitudinal studies. And you all know the examples of um, such studies, like Framingham, um, Baltimore studies, and some of them are on ongoing. For example, there's this Kronos lab, and um, these guys, they have panels of various markers, and they test them in a lot of um, patients. And uh, it would be a great idea to collaborate with labs like that, mm, and uh, because the, the amount of already collected data is tremendous and can be um, very useful. Uh, it is obvious that personalized science is um, one of the ways of life extension. So let me summarize. The integrated system of biomarkers <laughs> of aging will allow us to systematize the existing data um, about aging. It will <clears throat> um, help us to systematize data about age-related diseases. We'll be able to model the processes of aging and um, interventions. We will also have criteria for um, assessment of the efficacy of interventions. <clears throat> this is the main idea of my talk. We can do this right now, well, after, after creating the information system, obviously. But <clears throat> anyway, we do have <laughs> some very, very valuable information that can be um, applied to particular patients. And I'd like to thank, to thank my collaborators, Ekaterina Sivitska, Alexey Maskalov, and uh, Mikhail Batin, who is the head of Science for Life Extension Foundation, which I represent. And just a very quick note, we're organizing the Genetics of Aging and Longevity Conference in April in Moscow. And <clears throat> it's um, organized by the Gerontological Society of Russian Academy of Sciences, um, by the Science for Life Extension Foundation, by Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, also International Association of Aging and Geriatrics, and um, Institute of um, Biology on Science Center. So the topics include longevity genes in humans and model animals, genetics of regeneration, gerontology in silico, pharmacological interventions in aging, and quite a lot of other rather um, interesting topics and the meeting is international and anybody interested is more than welcome to participate and um, I thank you all very much for attention thank you <laughs>
very ambitious stuff. Um, I'm wondering, in the examples you gave, it seems to me in, that there's a, an, an ambiguity between biomarker in the sense of an entity that changes in a steady way over time and gives you an idea about a person's biological age and a factor that predicts a future rate of aging or negative health outcome. And of course, sometimes those things can be the same thing, but they aren't always, and sometimes they can diverge quite a bit. And a, a good example I'll use is IGF-1 levels, right? So normally IGF-1 levels fall with aging, mm -hmm. but at least in animal models, low IGF-1 levels steadily throughout life predict a slow rate of aging. So which side of that divide do you want to break things down on? Well, that is a good question. Um, whichever um, the processed um, scientific information would would tell us to. I mean, the system. Well, scientific information gives you both sides of that. That's why I'm asking. Well, um, then. Um, um, well, in each particular situation. Um, like there, there's not going to be a unified solution for, for a person, for a Drosophila, for you know a type of an organism. Every time the situation is really, really special, and when we have this ambiguity, um, we will have to um, take all of the existing um, information into account. And I think if we're looking at a particular person, we will be able to. Um, identify which side of you know those two ambiguous parties has more um, is is closer you know to to so the truth. So it would se seem to me what Pat had in the prior talk with with his flagging of the ambiguous boxes you know would be one of the well that can be that can solutions. be interpreted. I mean, I you mean, can certainly can flag it and and as, right, as, yeah. as currently unresolved. I mean you're talking about the preponderance of evidence. Um, so uh, I. I I think this is a very uh, laudable effort, and I, I would just like to point out that the uh, C. elegans bioinformatics community had uh, set a very similar goal within just this one simple less than a thousand cell organism, and they've yet to realize it, to come even close. But I, you might learn something from the model that they created and the difficulties that they've encountered. Okay. Um, We'd love that. Yeah. You must obviously do the same thing for each organism and in a relational database you can link the different organisms to see where there are parallels. Yep, it would be you. very nice. Sure. Greg? I commend you on your link to the primary literature in your database. I think that's essential because that's what we all need to evaluate in terms of the quality of the data. It seems also, uh, I'd like you to comment on whether you're going to need a separate database for every organism with aging and then um, within mammals with uh, a separate database for organs because, for example, gluconeogenesis, which may go up in the liver, goes down in muscle and brain with age. Right. That, uh, well, when I was talking about the objects, the change, so we observe a change and it's got the classificators, right? And there's the organism and the type of tissue. Um, so we are, um, some changes can be duplicated, but they would, since they have different classification um, fields, um, they will be all in like one big jar uh, of information, right? But the system will be able to retrieve the, the, um, any, everything relevant to, to well, C. elegans or, or a human and it would uh, look at the classification um, fields, and therefore it would not, you know, um, uh, well, mix the right and wrong information in each particular uh, situation. Okay, any other questions? There's one over there. It's a final question. Well, just a clarification question. Is, is your objective here to actually model and predict the behavior of, of the human body, for instance, during aging? Yes. Or is it as a reference manual? It's, it's, you actually intend to make predictions. Yes, we would mm. like to predict. We'd like to identify what the, um, what the magical combination of therapies would, would be uh, 
ideal for this particular person. Yes, we are. That's that's the um, that's the goal. Um, probably it's you know like a long term goal because mm -hmm. um, we would like uh, to have some differential equations that would describe um, the processes, but. As uh, Pat um, has m mentioned before, we cannot really do this right now. Um, and then, then essentially the same question as I asked the previous speaker. Uh, the accuracy of any prediction made would be heavily dependent on the complexity of the underlying system. And if you actually intend to model the pathways, the task would be enormous. Mm -hmm. So what level of accuracy do you expect you can achieve without like a, a, a complete matrix explosion underneath. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Well, hmm. Maybe the best that's possible. No, uh, would that possible count answer? as an answer? <laughs> okay. um, mm -hmm. um, well, we would basically, a, one patient, one person, would have an ideal situation, um, is to have the information system and a couple of, you know, by gerontologists attached to the system that would, um, at least at the first stages, um, you know, verify the, um, well, the quality of the predictions. But okay. eventually, um, the goal is to, you know, make the perfect predictions, whatever they may be. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.